Anyone have a favorite TV drama? Certainly, almost everyone watching today has a favorite TV drama. Maybe Outer Banks, uh, could be Outlander. Maybe you're more in the med into the medical shows, Chicago Med. Maybe you love Bull or The Good Doctor. My husband Chuck, on the other hand, has a favorite he's been watching for probably about 40 years, and it's Perry Mason. The drama of Perry Mason every single night at 10.30. Don't interrupt him because he loves Perry Mason. But for me, I love This Is Us. Now don't judge me. I love This Is Us. And I watched the first episode, a little confused. Then I watched the second and the third, and I was hooked. I loved what was happening in the families. Jack, I loved watching Kate and Toby and Kevin. And then there was Randall and Beth. If you love This Is Us, why don't you type it in the chat room? I'm curious if I have any other fans on here with me. But I remember it was about season three. And the first two seasons, I thought that Randall and Beth had it all going on. They seemed to get parenting. They seemed to get communicating. They knew how to manage their um, careers. And I loved how they communicated with each other. And then season three happened and everything started to fall apart. I was constantly ticked at Randall because he ran for councilman and he got the seat, but he didn't know how to balance work and life. And then Beth, Beth wanted to pursue her career as a dancer, but she didn't know how to quit ragging on Randall. And so they were always fighting and the tension in their home was thick. The girls felt it, Randall and Beth felt it, the tension was so thick you could cut it with a knife. And I'm curious, how many of you have had a little bit of drama in your homes the last few months? How many of you have had a little bit of tension? And maybe you're saying, well, Julie, our drama, our tension started long before COVID. Chuck and I have felt it. Chuck and I have had it. It seems like just lately he gets on my nerves when I'm cooking in the kitchen because I've been there a lot and he's hovering over me telling me I'm not putting the butter in right or I'm not putting in too, enough flour or I'm making too big of a mess in my kitchen and I just want to tell him to get out of my kitchen. So that's minor tension. Today we're going to talk about a couple Priscilla and Aquila who dealt with tension, who dealt with drama. And in order to understand what was going on, we need to read the text and then we need to go back a little bit. So the text is going to be on the screen. You might have your Bibles on your lap, but let's look at this scripture in Acts 18 verses 1 through 4. The text says, After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And there he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and he worked with them. Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time, and then he left the brothers and sisters and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. Now listen, Priscilla and Aquila are only mentioned a couple of times in Scripture, just a few times, and we don't know a lot about them. But we do know that these little known individuals were hugely influential in the early church. They weren't famous, and I think that's a reminder for us that throughout history, both then and now, people who are behind the scenes, who are not on public display, who are not famous, they have a lot to teach us. Now we know a lot about Paul, but we don't really know a lot about Priscilla and Aquila. We know that they were a couple, that they were married, that they spent a lot of time together. They were always mentioned together. We know that they were tent makers. We know they were hugely impactful in the first century church and that they lived in Rome. And in fact, some historians believe that Priscilla may have helped author the book of Hebrews. Now that's not proven fact, but some historians believe that. And in order to understand a little bit more about this couple, we need to know a little bit more about Rome and what was happening in first century Rome, because in Rome there was drama. There was a lot of drama. It wasn't a peaceful place to live like here in Ankeny, or probably like the community that you're living in right now and watching today. Rome was a huge city. It was around a million people 
That's how many people lived there at this time. It was the hub of the Roman Empire, and all the Roman emperors lived there. It was probably similar to Washington, D.C., because there was a lot of wealth in, Roman, in Rome. There were a lot of economic classes. There was a lot of indulgence, a lot of immorality of all kinds, and you can let your imagination kind of run wild there. Most of the people who lived in Rome were polytheistic, and that's a big word. You may not know what it means, but it means they worshipped several different gods. It might change from day to day to day. And so because of this, there were a lot of temples and shrines and places of worship without any centralized ritual of worship. Or practice about any form of worship was accepted. Also, Christianity had become a major presence there. It was a major presence in the late 40s AD and many, many small groups of Christ followers were gathering in small groups. They were gathering in house churches like what we've been doing for the last many weeks. Except they didn't have a video camera staring them in the face. They didn't have a microphone that was going to project the music. They were gathered in these tiny little places. And I've been to Ephesus and I've been to Corinth and some of those cities of antiquity and seen the tiny little houses. They were gathering in them to worship God week after week. Now what's interesting is that Roman authorities didn't necessarily care who you worshipped as long as you included the emperor and they didn't want you to create problems with other religious systems. And that was a problem for Jews and Christians. It was a big problem. And so the Jews and the Christians refused to worship the emperor. They refused to worship any other gods. And so per persecution was happening. In fact, it's told that there was one emperor, his name was Nero, and he would light Christians on fire and put them in his garden at night to light up his garden. Yeah, big time persecution. So this is the type of environment that Priscilla and Aquila fled. This isn't hardship because you can't buy a bottle of yeast to make the pizza dough that you want. This isn't hardship because you're having a tough time balancing teaching your kids and working from home. We can't even begin to imagine, right? This husband and wife were forced out of Rome by Emperor Claudius, they were forced to leave the place that they're rooted. They have no idea where they're going. They have no stability. They're not sure if they're going to be able to continue their tent making business. They have to make some cultural shifts. Everything about their lives has been uprooted and shifted. And they're not in a place where they should have any peace or any stability. And so I want to ask you, does that sound familiar? Sound just a little familiar? Sound at all like your last two months? You're uprooted from your routine. You're uprooted from your office. You're sent home with your computer and you need to work and homeschool your kids. You're sent packing from your job saying, go file for unemployment. I have a friend who recently said at the age of 60, I never dreamed I'd have to file for unemployment. And you're in a strange place. You're in a strange land. And we're reminded that a strange land requires strong faith. Yeah, say that to each other. Strange land requires strong faith. Listen, my husband and I don't have kids at home, but I'm a major people person. And I can only handle so much time at home by myself. And I know that I've been slightly annoying to my husband. If my husband is sitting right here, he would say, you've been more than slightly annoying to me. But I'm like, Chuck, can we go for a drive? Chuck, can we go for a bike ride? Chuck, can we go play pickleball? Chuck, can we take a drive? And it annoys him because quite honestly, Chuck would be just fine to sit at home by himself, down in the basement, without ever seeing anyone. So it's been a little strange. It's been a strange land. Definitely been a strange land. But Priscilla and Aquila... Man, they don't choose to complain. Maybe they did. We don't know. They don't say this is terrible. This isn't our fault. This is outside of our comfort zone. Together, what they do is they put their trust and their faith in God. And then that keeps them strong in this new land. It keeps them strong in this place that they probably had no intentions of ever going. They kept their focus on God. They kept it on his goodness and the plans that he had even when everything was outside of their control. 
Now listen, friends, I want us to remember that God will never leave us and he'll never forsake us. He tells that in his word. Some of you may be familiar with this scripture. I think it's found in Hebrews and it says, I will never leave you or forsake you. And he says, let's do this together. Let's do this together. And I'm going to help you through this difficult season. I'm going to help create a scenario where my plans and my purposes for your life are fulfilled. And that's what happened for Priscilla and Aquila. Well, providentially, they head to Corinth from Rome. And Paul happens to head there too. And they both happen to be tent makers. And God connects them at that moment. And God had a plan. All happening in the midst of chaos and uncertainty. And they join together with God to help do his work. And I'm wondering if you stopped long enough to ask yourselves, hmm, maybe, just maybe, maybe God, you're working a much bigger plan in my life, much bigger than my plan. You know, Corinth wasn't exactly a peaceful place. It wasn't a whole lot better than Rome. It was another huge city. It had a long-standing reputation for immorality. And at any rate, in Corinth, they happened to connect with Paul. And the first thing they do is show hospitality. Scripture tells us that Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. And verse 11 says Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. So together, they're discipled by Paul because of their act of hospitality. And it opened a door for them to know Jesus, to know him more, and then for others to know Jesus. And I recognize that the past few months, there haven't been a whole lot of opportunities for hospitality. We've had to socially distance for two months. Some of you have put yourself on extreme lockdown. However, others of you have figured out how to show hospitality. You're neighboring. I've seen it in our neighborhood. I saw it with a friend whose daughter recently graduated and their whole neighborhood put together a graduation party in their cul-de-sac. It was a sweet thing. Some of you are talking to strangers and people who live down the street that you've never met before. Some of you have probably even offered um, cookies to the UPS man because you're so excited to see somebody. But I think we need to remember that we shouldn't minimize the gift of hospitality because it often opens the door for opportunities and new relationship. And because Priscilla and Aquila showed hospitality, Their relationship with Jesus grows, their connection with Paul grows, and then their little house church continues to grow and grow and grow. And obviously, Paul gets to know their heart and their gifts, and he takes them with them from Corinth to Ephesus. So they're on the go again to another strange land. And we learn there that things weren't easy for them. Because in the book of Romans, Paul says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila. They're my fellow workers in Christ who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks. Now listen, we don't know exactly what Paul was talking about here. We don't know what happened exactly, but we, it's implied that these two endangered their lives to save Paul's. And we can assume that they continued to experience hardship. We can assume that all the while they're making their home an extension of their ministry. They're expanding the gospel, but they're experiencing difficulty. And because of their willingness to be a home and to be a couple that shared the gospel together, they made a difference in other people's lives. Another guy kind of is on the scene in this story. His name is Apollos. And we read about Apollos in verses 24 and 26. It says, A Jew named Apollos, who was a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. And he was a learned man. He was thorough, had a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He'd been instructed in the way of the Lord. And he spoke with a great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately. But the text says, Though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. And so what did Priscilla and Aquila do? They hear him. They see that maybe his theology is a little off, and so they start teaching him. They invite him into their home. They start explaining him more thoroughly the way of God. He's smart. He's prominent. He probably understood repentance, but he didn't fully understand the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Maybe he didn't understand the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. 
and they weren't intimidated by him, but rather they discipled him. They invested in him. And Apollos goes on to be hugely influential in the early Christian church. And you can read more about his story in the book of Acts. And so I want to ask you also today, who are you investing time with? Who are you investing time with? Some of you are saying, I've been investing time in my kids. And that is the most important thing that you do, that you spend time and invest in your family. But we also have opportunities to invest in others. And it's so easy to surround ourselves with Christian friends who think like us and do the same things that are like us and to just want to hang out with other Christians. But God never calls us to a life of comfort and safety and ease. He calls us to a life that pushes us out of our comfort zone. He pushes us out of safety and ease. And he says, go meet new people, make new relationships, live out my command to go and tell. We should all be people who are constantly growing up in our faith so that we can live on mission in the world and then disciple others to live on mission. And listen, I recognize that some of you watching today probably aren't there yet. Maybe you're still exploring Jesus. Maybe you're new to a relationship with God. And I'm so glad that you're watching today. But here's what I want to say to you. Find someone to walk alongside of you. You may know somebody, somebody that you've um, maybe admired in your past or in your present. See if they'd be willing to mentor you. For us here at the Ridge, we have a women's mentoring program. You might reach out to us, info at ridgelife.org. Or you can email me, jweeman at ridgelife.org. We can hook you up with someone. We have men who would mentor, women who would mentor. But I also want to speak to those of you who have been following Christ for a long time and you've never taken someone alongside of you. And you've never sat down and studied the word together. Because I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to go and to tell and to help someone else grow up in their faith because the opportunities and the need to sow into others' lives is, lives is immense. And if we listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, then we won't be afraid. Well, we may be a little afraid, a little intimidated, but when we start walking alongside others, you never know how God's going to use that person. You never know how God's going to use that person in influential ways to expand his kingdom. Well, as you continue on in scripture, as the story kind of comes to a conclusion, we learn that eventually when the emperor Claudius dies, Priscilla and Aquila go back to Rome. They establish a house church there. They go back. They go back to what was familiar, to the home that they loved, to the city that they loved, maybe to friends who are still there that they loved. They went back to the place where possibly they even first met and fell in love. They went back. But here's what I've been asking as I read this story time and time again, that they may have gone back to a city that they knew, to a place that they called home, but it was different. And they were different. They weren't the same people. You don't experience what Priscilla and Aquila did, going from place to place to place, planting house churches, sowing into people's lives. You don't go back and get forced from your home and move to strange lands and not be different. And so I want to ask you today, as you begin looking towards the next several weeks, and maybe as you look back at the months that you've been to, I want to ask you, have you asked God, God, how can I use what was back there to make me different over here? How can I look back here, back to the last two months and learn some lessons so that I can be different over here? What do I need to do? For some of you, it's a realization that you've tried to do life on your own for way too long. And maybe you've tried to do it on your own for a good chunk of this last um, pandemic season. And I want to encourage you to start having conversations with God and say, God, how can I look back here and be different over here? Maybe it's a recognition that you need a relationship with Christ and that you've never really fully surrendered your life to Jesus and that you want to. 
For some of you, maybe it's dealing with grief or loss. Because the reality is there's been a lot of grief. There's been a lot of loss. Some of you had hoped that you would finish your graduation and have, be able to walk across the stage. Some of you had to postpone a wedding. I have a niece who's a, an amazing cross country runner and she was positioned to place probably in the top one or two um, of the cross country season in state. And that season's gone. For us, we were planning a trip to go overseas to see our daughter. And we don't get to see her very often. And there's loss there. And so if that's something that you need to deal with back here before you can move over here, I'm going to encourage you to do that. We have a, a class that's coming up. I think it starts the second week of June. It deals with anxiety. You might go speak to a counselor. I've done that in the past when I had to figure out how to walk through grief. And it can be healthy. It's not a weakness. It's, it shows strength. So maybe you need to figure out how to deal with the loss. But friends, we need to ask, and I hope you will ask, what you've discovered about yourselves in this. What have you rediscovered about yourself? And what have you discovered about who God is and who he is in your lives? And then I hope that on the other side of this pandemic, that you would start fixing your eyes more and more and more on Jesus, that you wouldn't just be doing it right now, but that would be something that you do long term, that you realize how important your relationship with Jesus is. He wants us to do with other pe this with other people. He wants us to be the church. He wants us to do it together as a couple. He wants us to do it even if we're individuals living in our own homes. He wants us to have community and he wants us to do relationship with others together so that we can continue to go and tell people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wants us to be like Priscilla and Aquila, together with one another, together with God, letting him lead us and guide us every single step of the way so that what was back there will make us better over here. Let's pray.